so we're gonna we've already talked about um, this important connection, um, which I think I mentioned was the fundamental theorem of calculus, um, and that was area. And then the other thing I told you that you had to remember was uh, you should think of this as an infinite sum. It's going to make sense uh, more in some of our problems to think of it that way as an infinite sum. Just like in derivatives, sometimes it makes more sense to think of it as a rate of change as it does a tangent line. So that was the first thing that we talked about. Um, the other one is that if we had the derivative of an integral, let me see if I can get better. That's uh, Maybe I can... That's a little better. Um, if you take the derivative of an integral, you get back to the function where you started. Um, I'd like to show you why this is, because sometimes when you forget how it works, it's easier to, 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 to try it again. So what I would do here is I would say, well, what if I took the derivative? This one says it's the antiderivative at x minus the antiderivative at a. Okay? And here we're saying that a is any constant. So if I was to do this, the uh, difference, it, it, there's no, the difference rule in a derivative is you just take the derivative one at a time. So it's going to be the derivative of the antiderivative minus the antiderivative at A. Now, because A is a constant, that means this is just some number, so it would disappear. So it does not matter if that number is a 0, a 5, a 10, a negative 10. A pi or an e, whatever it is, it's going to disappear because it's a constant. We take the derivative of a constant, it's zero. However, the derivative of an antiderivative is back to where you started, and that's why we end up with f of x. So we'll look at how these connections are important today. Um, and one thing that you're going to be asked to do on the AP exam is to connect all three levels, you know, between the function, the antiderivative, and the derivative together. So that's what we're going to try doing here. So, um, sorry, is that okay to move down? So we're going to take a look at this funny looking graph, and this is typical of what your AP exam likes to give you, because it's, the areas are simple, they're triangles and squares. So there's not a lot of difficult math to do, but conceptually you have to think about the connection between the function, the derivative, and the antiderivative. So <clears throat> if I define G to be given as this, the derivative, that says um, the derivative, let me see if I can... I don't know why it always crackles like that whenever I, is that better? A little better, I think. So g of x is going to be defined as the antiderivative from 0 to x on this function here. So this is the graph for f prime of x. So um, if we were to look at this, could anybody tell me, Actually, you know what, maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll start the first one off just to give you an idea how this would work. Um, g of 4 would mean that I put in 4 for x, so I would get the integral from 0 to 4. And if I look at the picture here, um, it would appear that this is the area that I'm looking for. Okay. So to do that, then, I could calculate the... Uh, antiderivative. Um, it has an area here of six units and then this triangle is width two and height three so it would have three units um, of area there. So six and three this would be equal to nine. So it's possible to calculate that interpreting the picture the way we have um, in the last block as well. So I'd like you to talk uh, with a neighbor. What would it be if we wanted to use this picture to figure out what's the graph at negative 4 for g of negative 4? So one thing we should start with here is we should say, what is this actually asking for? This is asking for the integral from 0 to negative 4 of that picture up there. So if that's the case, then does anybody not like something about the way this integral is set up? Is there something that makes you go, oh, why did they do it this way? What's that? 
Okay, well, that's all right. I mean, if you look at it here, there's one underneath, and there's one up here, but what's going to happen to them? They're going to cancel each other out. out. Right, they would cancel out. So we don't have to worry about those two so much, but um, the area then that we're going to be looking for is, is really, it's this piece is the net area I'm, I'm looking for. Wait, what about that one, one three units to the left, left of it? Um, from 0 to negative 4, that would be all the area that we find, right? This is negative 4 here. So then why is there more graph? Um, well, just, we don't need the whole graph. We've only asked from, from 0 to neg negative 4, to, sorry, 0 to negative 4. So, um, how much area is in here? <laughs> negative 6. Okay, well, there's negative 6 in there. What's the answer for this question? Okay, I'll give you two choices. How many people say six? How many people say negative six? Six. So this will be for six. Let's see, hands up if you think six. Okay, hands up if you say negative six. Okay, people who said six, you're correct. How come? Because negative times a negative equals positive. All right. <laughs> Can somebody give me an easy way to rephrase this integral that would make more sense to people who don't see it? There's something weird about this integral. <coughs> Usually when we do this, we go from the smaller number to the bigger number. So this means I'm going backwards. The direction that I moved was backwards. So the area is in fact negative 6, but we went there backwards, right? So what I could say to keep you from getting tripped up is write it in the normal direction from negative 4 to 0. If we go in the normal direction, then you don't have to think so hard about is this negative or positive. So it's going to be the negative of negative 6, which is positive 6. Or, like I said, you could think about it like this area is negative, but I was asked to go backwards. So the negative times the negative puts me at positive 6. Okay, okay um, what if I'm asking for the derivative of g at 1? Where do you think that they're asking for then? Well, can anybody explain? Sounds like you're onto something, Connor. Have you got a? Yeah. So if we think about, if you, what does g do? G is an antiderivative. Now we're taking the derivative of the antiderivative. We go back to where we started. So this thing is equal to what was left behind if we got rid of the antiderivative's derivative. So f prime of 1, that's right here. Um, this is the graph, f prime of x. So f prime of 1, that has a value of 3. Now, what if I wanted the second derivative of g? What would the second derivative of g be? Remember, we're always trying to think, how do we go from g to the picture here, which is f? So can anybody make a connection from g double prime to this graph? Sure, Danny. The derivative of the graph that I see here. So that means you go one more, and I'll end up at f double prime. So I want the derivative of this graph. So can anybody tell me what will f double prime of 1 look like? according to this picture. Yeah, 0 is correct. So you could think about it, it's the derivative of the graph at 1. This derivative here, that would be 0. Yeah, there's no change. So it's equal to 0. Now, we're going to try and move backwards now. So I have to give you a good example to, to help set your mind up. So just you can this may be a useful example to copy in, but I'm going to do it on a separate slide. So I'll just see, does anybody recognize, uh, anybody recognize a graph that might look like this? I'll see if it... Uh, Is it a parabola? No. 
there's tons of ways to interpret this graph. But anybody recognize? Have you ever seen? It doesn't not the up and downs of it, but has anybody like seen this? I see it on the screen when I see this. A skyline and a city. Yeah, a treadmill. So for me, I think this is like when I'm running on the treadmill, and up here it tells me my speed, and this is the time that I've been running. Okay. So at any instant we know my rate of change, right? You know my rate of change. For example, right at this time, you can figure out how fast I was running, okay? So to keep the math simple, let's just say that this is um, two miles an hour, um, three miles an hour, one mile an hour, and maybe this would be five miles an hour, okay? And not that I ever do this, um, but to keep the math simple again, let's say this was one hour, two hours, three, each one of those chunks is an hour. How far have I run? The area inside those triangles. So how far did I go? I went two miles an hour for one hour, so I went two miles. Then I went three miles, which is the area of this rectangle. Then I went two miles here. Then I only ended up going one mile there, but five miles there. So if I add up all the change, that's equal to the area. I'm adding up every instant of my speed times how long I ran that far. So in this instance, it's going to be 7, 8, 13 miles. And the reason it's important to think about it this way is I took my rate of change and I, what did I, what's the calculus thing that we just did here? We found area, and, and what are we calling this in? Um, it's an antiderivative, right? So um, when I'm going from the speed, which is all the data I was given, is this is my data about speed. Antiderivative now tells me my position. I'm 13 miles from where I started. So the uh, antiderivative, yes? Isn't the, pur the purpose of a treadmill so that you're running without going anywhere? Yeah, that's the purpose for the treadmill, yes. So technically, I'm still on the same spot. But anyways, um, but right, I'm 13 miles is how far my legs have moved. Can we agree on that then? Yeah. OK. Um, so 13 miles away, I can figure out my total change. Now, obviously, in the, you know, if you were running out on the street, it's not like a treadmill, right? It might be a curve like this. If you wanted to know how far did you run, well, you'd have to integrate that curve, right? So. Anyways, the treadmill is nice because they're nice little blocks and we can all figure out how far the person went. So that's the idea we want to think about when, we, when I ask you these next two questions. Okay. What's the minimum and maximum values of f? Not the derivative, but f itself. Here's the picture that I've given you as the hint. So I'm going to clear this picture so we can talk about it. And. If this is its derivative, how on earth do I figure out minimums and maximums? So to get you started thinking about this, um, first of all, can anybody tell me at um, x equals 1, does anybody know what the position of this graph is? Um, there's a hint up here. Does anybody know what the position of that particle or whatever it is is going to be at x equals 1? Zero. Greater than zero. Bigger than three? Over 9,000? Less than 9,000? Right. So it says at zero it's equal to two. What's the total amount of change that it's undergone by the time I end up at one? This is like the treadmill, right? This tells me how much change. If I wanted to add up every one of these little changes, how much is the total change? Three units of change have happened, and I started at two. That means I'm now at five. Because I've started at two, this is a positive derivative, so I'm increasing. How much did I increase by? Well, the area underneath is the total change. Just like on the treadmill, I'm adding up all the change. So my question now is, where are those minimums and maximums? I actually want the values. Um, Here's one, here's one, here's one, 
Here's one. And we better check our endpoints too. So to make this a little bit more efficient, let's go, um, I'm going to pick on someone in this row to do the endpoint. So you may want to discuss it. I'm going to pick on, uh, sorry, I'm going to go from left to right. So this endpoint, I'll pick on um, someone in this row to do this one here, which is a maximum, and someone to do this one here, which is a minimum. Okay, so you may want to discuss these ones. Um, in this row here, I'm going to pick on somebody to do this one, which is a maximum, and this one, which is a minimum. And in the final row here, I'm going to pick on somebody to tell me about this endpoint. What is the value if you get all the way there? Okay, so I'll come around and see how you're doing with it, but I'd like to know what is the actual value of the function. All right, so from what I came around to, hopefully we're getting closer to it. Um, let's start here with the first endpoint that I asked. Uh, the first endpoint that I asked for was this one right here. So let's say, Robbie, um, what's the value at that endpoint, which is f of negative 7? 11. 11 is correct. So I'll say it the first time, and then I'm going to, I won't repeat it again. But uh, if we move along here, this is how I would, I would kind of pick those figures on the AP exam and just record it. This would be 1.5. This would be negative 1.5. Um, the next figure I see is this big square, which has negative 9. Then I see a negative 1.5 for this triangle. Then I see a positive 1.5. So if I know that when f of 0, this curve equals to 2, one way that you can reassure yourself you're doing it properly is I would write this in my margin. I would say if I go from negative 7 and I add up all the change to 0, then that means I should be at the value 2. So f of negative 7 plus all my change gets me to the position of 2. So what is all the change that happened? 1 and a half minus 1 and a half, it's gone. Negative 9 minus 1 and a half, now I'm at negative 10 and a half. Plus 1 and a half, that's now back to negative 9. So the total change, um, minus 9, gets me to 2 which means f of negative 7 would be 11. Okay. The other way you can think about it is because you're moving backwards, we're moving in this direction, you're then having to subtract the areas. So you're subtracting. You could say I start at, um, let's see here. You could say I start at 2, and then the first area I hit is this one. So take away 1.5. The next area I hit is here. Take away negative 1.5. The next area I hit, I hit is this one. Take away negative 9, take away negative 1.5, and take away 1.5. And it's going to be at the same place, which is also 11. It's good to record the numbers like this, um, because then as you're asked more things about the graph, you don't have to keep recalculating the areas. So uh, now we'll talk about this one here is worth repeating. This is a maximum, because the derivative is positive up here negative up here. So the graph went from increasing to decreasing. So I don't know, it's going to be a curve, maybe it'll look like that. But remember, you're looking at the derivative here, you're not looking at the function. So um, what did we get? How about EJ? What did we get for this maximum uh, right here? That's correct. And for the minimum, because it goes from negative to positive, um, let's see here. Gary, what would you get for the minimum? Sorry? So that's correct. And we're at uh, negative 1. It was a half. OK. Um, what about the next? What's that, a maximum from positive to negative? So what did your group come up with? Um, Connor? 11. 11 is correct. And f of 7. That's my next um, minimum. I went from negative to a positive. Uh, Myron? 13 over 2? Okay, so give it to me, that would be six, six and a half? Yeah, six and a half. Okay, um, and then the end point up here, let's say, mm, Jeremy, yeah, Jeremy. Uh, six? <laughs> six? No. Can anybody help him out? Yeah. Ming, do you want to help us out? Okay, well, let's double check this one. 
So again, if we want it to go the same route that I've already talked about, let me clean this stuff up. We're going in the positive direction this time. So we have to add all the change as we move this way. Okay? So we're going to add all the change up. We started at 2, and here I can see this has 6 units. This triangle here has 3 units of area, negative 3, um, negative 1.5 positive 1.5. So if we're, if we're quick about this, we could say, well, those cancel out. So the only difference is it's moved six units from where it started. Where did it start? It started at two, so it should be at eight here. Okay, yes. Yeah. Um, again, if you want to figure it out and say, like, how do I do this? Well, we go this time from f of zero plus all the change, I should end up at f of 8. Okay. That means, uh, sorry, 2 plus all the change, which we just figured out was 6, gets me to f of 8, which is 8. Okay. So if we look at all these spots, this would be my maximum, and this would be my minimum. And the value would be 12 and a half, the minimum value would be 0.5. So that interpretation, we will keep practicing it. Um, your textbook doesn't do the best job of reminding you about it, so I will make sure we keep practicing it. But that is fairly typical of what an AP question would ask you to do. Okay. All right. Uh, oops, that's not it. Fundamental theorem. There we go. Okay. So um, this was minimum was 0.5. Maximum was uh, 12.5. Okay, so for the sake of time, um, we're just going to do these antiderivatives. We're not going to punch them in the calculator, though. So what I mean is in this first example, what we're going to do is we would write this as x cubed over 3, take away 3x from 1 to 2. Right? If you make a calculator mistake at this point, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen to you, but I, I believe you could probably do it if you can get to this spot. So I want you to try doing this. Um, be careful when you think about this one here, because you're going to have to probably be clever about how you integrate it. Okay, so I'll give you a couple of minutes, maybe with a neighbor to, to look over and see how you've done, but find the antiderivatives. You don't need to give me a number, though. top row, um, if we found those antiderivatives. And the bottom one, it's hard to see. That might look like a 0. It's actually an e. But uh, that one's going to be the natural log of x evaluated from 1 to e. And we don't need to worry about the absolute value here because those numbers are all positive. So that's OK. Right, because natural logs derivative would go back to 1 over x. That's one tricky because people tend to think power rule, but remember that's going to be a natural log that has its antiderivative. So let's discuss the, uh, the one here. Um, what would you do with this? Do you know where the graph becomes funny, where it makes its uh, change? It's the absolute value? Yeah, the absolute value is what's causing the problem, but where does it cause the problem? Uh, uh, the zero. <coughs> So where does it equal to zero? Uh, x equals 1.5. Yeah, to half. 0.5. So at x equals 1 half, this is where the piecewise graph splits. So that's what we'll do too. So the first graph would be, um, I'm going to go from 0 to 1 half. And this is going to be numbers which make it negative. right? If I put in you know, a quarter. 
then I'm half minus one is negative. So the way you get rid of the negative is you take the negative of the absolute value graph. So that's the negative piece. And then we're going to do the positive piece, which goes from 1 half to 2. And it'll be as shown. You can take that piece. So that would be um, negative x squared plus x from 0 to a half plus x squared plus, sorry, minus x. from one-half to two. Um, and again, it's because this is the positive piece. We don't have to flip the sign. So there's one last idea. It's a pretty, uh, pretty kind of interesting idea, but it's pretty simple too. Um, and that's if we were to take a look at the area as a curve and figure out, is it possible to squish this curve into a block? So you think about the area as being like um, maybe clay or putty, something that's moldable and soft. And the pink shaded region, it's hard to see that it's pink on your screen, but the pink shaded region there would be the actual curve. So this, you know, sort of windy piece like that. Whereas the, uh, the one we're trying to find is how can we fill in this with the piece here, so it makes a nice block, a boring old block. It's actually fairly simple to do this because what we're saying then <coughs> is the width of my rectangle would be B minus A for the width, and then the height is um, this value, which I'll show you how to find, that makes the height of the rectangle. So how could we write it out? Well, this is the height times the width. will have to be the same as if I did it as a curve, and I integrated the area underneath the curve. So this is for my square, and this is for my curve. Okay. So one thing that makes it interesting is, instead of allowing the graph to go up and down like it does here, like up, down, um, if we make it into a square, and it has the same amount of area, we've just found what the average value would be if we made the function assume one value all the way through. So the average value for this graph is the one shown here. And um, I guess here it's shown better with uh, all the, the scratch marks on it. But that shows me what the average value is. right? So maybe this is the population of a country over time. What's the average value over those 20 years? Well, we can find it by integrating it and solving for this height. So if I solve for the height, I've got to divide the width. And that's what I did here, is I just divided it by the width. And that leaves me with this piece right here. So it's usually called the mean value theorem for integrals because you, could, you should be able to convince yourself, like think about it this way. Imagine the curve was ice. It was a piece of ice that was all molded funny. And you stuck it in a container. Eventually that ice would settle to a block, right? It would fall, the water would turn into a flat object, right? So it would exist for any curve that you, nice smooth curve that you could make into an ice sculpture. Eventually it would all melt down into a block. So it would exist for every one of these curves. Kind of like we said, the mean value theorem, a guaranteed existence about something in the derivative. So we guarantee this value will exist and we can find an average value as long as we can integrate it. So um, for this one here, I'll walk you through how that would work. Um, first, we're gonna go about this by finding the area. Um, what we have is, um, sorry, it's going to be the integral from 1 to 3 of 9 over x cubed. That's going to be negative 9 over 2, x to the negative 2, evaluated at, uh, let's see here, 1 to 3. So rather than do it by hand, I will punch it into the calculator. And my calculator gives me an area of 4. Okay. So I know that the ice sculpture that hasn't melted yet has a, an area of 4. And what I'd like to do is figure out where will it settle once I've let the uh, ice melt. 
So how wide was it? Wide. The width is 2. So the average height times the width must be equal to 4. So that means my average height is going to be 2. So this graph, whatever the curve would be to look like, its average height over that entire span would be 2. That's where the melt water would melt to and it would level out at 2. So where did this happen? What's the value? Well, we would solve then. Where does 2 equal 9 over x cubed? That would mean, um, let's see here, x cubed is 9 over 2. So x would happen at the cube root of 9 halves. So this is where it happens, and this is how much. Oops, sorry, the average value is 2. This is where, and this is how much. So I'll have you try it with just a polynomial, but what I'd like you to find, just find me the average value. If this is your polynomial here, what's the average value that that polynomial would take on over 1 to 4? Right, so you're going to find your area. It's a nice pretty curve. And as the uh, curve is squished into a block, where would it settle? What would the average height be? OK, so let's first start by figuring out how much area we've got. So the integral from 1 to 4 of 3x squared minus 2x from 1 to 4. Um, this is going to be x cubed take away x squared from 1 to 4. And the amount of area under this curve would then be um, 64 take away 16 subtract um, 0. So I would have 48. The area under this curve is 48 units. So the width of the curve is 3 units. So if it's 3 units wide and I have 48 for the area, the average value is the area divided by 3 which means this block would settle down at 16. Okay.